Hey everyone, Mr. Fransky here. Uh, we're going to do a quick video about um, just the 1.7 kind of uh, math, like modeling, thinking in a mathy way. I'm um, just going to run through these problems for you guys. Um, and let's see how it goes. So these sentence problems, um, not too bad. You just kind of have to think about what the tightest thing is closest to the x. So they say one positive number is twice another positive number. So let's say they're x and y. So we have x and y. So one number is twice another positive number. So that tells me that um, we can do x equals 2y or y equals 2x. Let's do y equals 2x. It tells us the sum of the two numbers is 390. So x plus y is 390. So let's put the 2x right where that y is because we can substitute it in. y and 2x are the same thing. So I have x plus 2 more x equal to 390. So I have 3x equal to 390. I think that means that x is, let's see if we divide by 3, that's 130. Okay, so that gives me the one number. And they say find the two numbers, so we've got to find them both. So the y is 2x, that means y is 260. So these problems just take some practice being able to do those, uh, those sentence problems. All right, Joe, John receives a 3.5% pay cut. His salary after the cut uh, was $52,530. What was his salary before the pay cut? All right, so what I think about this way is I always try to do things with 100 when I have something like this. So like if you make $100 let's say an hour or whatever, I don't know, I don't know, anyone makes $100 an hour, that'd be pretty great, um, and he receives a 3.5% pay cut, that means he would lose 350. So you subtract 0 0.35, 0, oh, sorry, 0 0.035, because 3.5%, times 100, and that gives you your new salary. So I'm going to use the same idea on this guy. So I don't know what his original pay was, let's call that X. So he's making X, and he lost... 3.5% of x, and that ended up being 52,530. So now we just do some algebra. So if I factor out an x here, I'm left with 1 minus 0 0.035, and that's equal to 52,530. So 1 minus 0.035, that is 0 0.0965, um, or 0 0.965, excuse me. So I have x times 0 0.965 equal to 52,530. Now, at this point, i got to grab a calculator. Um, i going to divide both sides by 0 0.965. You won't need a calculator on the test. Um, all the problems are numbers that you're going to be able to do without a calculator. Uh, but in this case, we'd have to grab a calculator. I actually end up with x equaling $54,435.23. There we go. All right, next up. The chemistry lab at the U of M keeps two acid solutions on hand. One is 20% acid and the other is 35%. How much of each solution should be used to prepare 25 liters of 26% solution? All right, so we have to make our two equations for this. We have our total amount and we have our stuff. All right, so for the total amount, we're going to do is we know that we have an X and a Y. So let's say X is the 20% solution and Y is a 35% solution. And we want to make 25 liters. So we know X plus Y has to equal 25. That's the total amount of, uh, of liters we have. And then the stuff, so this is the actual acid. So 0.2x, that tells me how much acid I actually get from the x, plus 0.35y. It's going to be equal to 0.26 times 25, because I know I have 25 at the end. Well, now we have two equations and two variables. That's good. Uh, let's solve this guy over here for x. So x is going to be equal to 25 minus y. Now we'll sub that in over here where the x is. So we put that in here. We have 0.2 times 25 minus y. Uh, sorry, plus 0.35y again. Is equal to uh, 0.26 times 25. Let's just leave it like that for now. Now, I'm going to make my life easier by uh, multiplying both sides here by 100. So I'm going to have um, 20 times 25 minus y plus 35y equal to 26 times 25. And now let's multiply those out. So it looks like we're going to have 500, if I distribute in here, minus 20y plus 35y equal to 26 times 25, that is 650. Okay, so now let's see, we have 500 uh, plus 15y equal to 650. And if we subtract 500, we have 15y equal to 150. Hey, y is 10. So 10 liters 
And then if we come back here to x, x is 25 minus y, so x is 15 liters. So if we use 10 liters of the, uh, what was it, 35% solution, and to, uh, 15 liters of the 20% solution will get to 26. That makes sense to me because um, we need more of the lower concentration to get it down to 26 because 35 is too high, right? We're closer to the 20% solution, so we should use more of it. Nice. All right, a river has risen eight feet above its flood stage. The water begins to recede at three inches per hour. Write a model to show the number of feet above flood stage after T hours. Okay, so the way I think about this is that we are losing three inches per hour. That's a quarter of a foot, right? Because they tell us they want to give us the number of feet above flood stage, flood stage after T hours. So I'm going to use a quarter of a foot. So we're losing that every hour. I think about that as like a slope. Right, because we're losing a constant amount every uh, every hour, and um, so this is going to be some kind of a linear equation. So the height, well, we know that we start at eight. So if you ever think about this, like on a graph, eight is like our y-intercept, and then we're going to have a constant slope of negative one fourth. So every time we go over four hours, we drop one foot. Okay, so that just is a line, right, with a slope of negative one-fourth and a y-intercept of eight. So you write this as negative one-fourth um, t, because we're using time, and hours, plus eight. The way you do probably see this written would be eight minus a quarter t, because this kind of makes sense for the way that the, uh, the problem is stated. You start at eight feet above flood stage, and then every hour you lose a quarter of it, right? So it's receding, it's going down a quarter of a foot every hour. Nice. All right, if the water continually recedes at this weight, rate, excuse me, when will the river be one foot above its flood stage? Well, that means I want it to be one foot above, eight minus a quarter t. Uh, let's see here. If I add a quarter t and subtract one, I have a quarter t equal to seven. Multiply by four, t is 28. So 28 hours, it'll be one foot above its flood stage. Nice. All right, Queen Inc., tennis racket manufacturer, determines... Whoop, the annual cost C of making X rackets is $23 per racket plus $125 in fixed overhead costs. Costs the company $8 to string a racket. So first it wants to find a function that models the cost of producing X unstrung rackets. So we're just going to ignore the $8 to string a racket for a second here. So the current cost of making X rackets is $23 per racket. So C is 23, uh, let's call it X. So X is the number of rackets because they tell us that we're making X unstrung rackets. And then plus the constant amount that they always have to pay, which is 125000 That's it. Okay, so linear again, kind of like our last one with the flood stage. Now find a function that models the cost of producing X strung rackets. Well, this time I'm going to have uh, the $23 per racket plus the $8 more dollars per racket. So C will be 23X plus 125000 and then I also have to add 8x to string each of those rackets. It costs $8. So I could rewrite that as, uh, let's see, 31x plus 125,000. There you go. Now, suppose each unstrung racket sells for $56. How many unstrung rackets would they have to sell before they start to turn a profit? So what I want to do here is figure out when that cost turns to zero. So we have the 31x... Um, they're uh, unstrung rackets, excuse me. So we're coming back up to here. So I have 23x plus 125,000 is going to be equal to, so they we want to know when that is equal to $56 times x. So how many do they have to sell times 56 is going to equal out their cost. So let's subtract 23x from both sides. So I have 125,000 equal to, let's see, 56 minus 23, what is that, 33? Is that right? Let's see, 33, I think so. 33x. Now divide both sides by 33. Going to grab a calculator for that. Again, on the test, all the problems are going to be simple enough. You won't have to use a calculator. I'm going to do 125,000 divided by 33. And I get 3787.87. 3787.87. Now, of course, in the real world, we can't have a fraction of a racket. So I'm going to say 33,788. If they sell 3,788 unstrung rackets, they're going to make a profit. So now, 
each strung racket sells for $79. How many strung rackets would they have to sell before they start to turn a profit? So that's actually a really good markup, right? Because it only costs $8 to string every racket. So they're making a lot more money on those strung rackets. All right, well, let's take a look. So now we use our strung racket uh, equation, which is 31x plus 125,000. Got to be equal to 79x. So subtract that 31, and we get, uh, what is that, 48? 125,000 equals 48x. Divide both sides by 48. Grab my calculator again. Looks like x is 2604.16, so 2605 rackets. Okay. All right, Ronaldo's interior design recommends putting a border around the top four walls of a dining room that is three feet longer than it is wide. So we have this dining room, and not to run well, but it's three feet longer than it is wide. So let's say this is W, this is W plus three. Okay, it's three feet longer than it is wide. Find the dimensions of the room if the total length of the border is 54 feet. Okay, so the total length of the border is just going to be the perimeter around the outside, right? So we have all four of these walls together has got to be 54. So we have how many W's? 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have W plus W plus W plus 3 plus W plus 3. All of those are out together. The perimeter has to equal 54. Now let's put it together. So we got 4 W's plus 6 equal to 54. Subtract 6. So we have 4 W equals what? 48. That works out nicely. W is 12. Now they're asking for the dimensions, so we have to actually figure out. So the width is 12, and that would mean that the length is 15. So it's a 12 by 15 dining room. There you go. Okay, getting to these fun triangle ones. The base of an isosceles triangle is half as long as the two equal sides. So we have A across the bottom, and this is 2A. That means this is also 2A, right? Because isosceles means those two are the same. Write the area of the triangle as a function of the length of the base. So they want the area of the triangle in terms of A. So the tricky thing here is usually we don't do uh, the area of a triangle in terms of just the base. So what we have to do is we have to figure out what the height is in terms of uh, the base A here. Because we know the area of this triangle is going to be 1 half base, which is A, times the height, which is H. But they only want it in terms of the length of the base, which is A. So what I have to do is find a formula for H in terms of A. Okay. Well, we know that the side length is 2A, which is helpful. So this is obviously not to scale, because that would have to be a lot longer. But I think we can do that using Pythagorean theorem. So if I kind of break out this triangle right here, this right triangle, we know that we can use Pythagorean theorem on a right triangle. So we have down here, this would be half A, or I'm going to write A over 2. This is 2A right here. And now what I want to do is find a formula for H. So I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem to do that. I know that H squared plus A over 2 squared is going to be equal to 2A squared. So that's H squared plus A squared over 4 is equal to 4A squared. I'm trying to solve for H. Okay, so if we subtract a squared over 4 from both sides, I have h squared equals 4a squared minus a squared over 4. Let's see if we can combine those. So we have h squared is, let's see, this is be 16 over 4. So 16a squared over 4 minus a squared over 4. So h squared is 16 minus 1 is 15a squared over 4. Okay. And so we square root both sides. So h is equal to uh, root 15a, goodness, over 2. So then we come back to our area formula right here. Just plug in the h. So a is 1 half ah. Just plug that in right there. So the area is equal to 1 half a times root 15a over 2 which is going to end up being a squared root 15 over 4. Wow, that's a fun one. Not too bad. A lot of algebra, right? That common denominator here, I've noticed we've been struggling with that a little bit. Just seeing this, and we have to think, well, we have to get that over 4, so that's a 16 fourths there. Nice. Okay. An isosceles triangle has its base along the x-axis. 
with one base vertex at the origin, and its vertex uh, in the first quadrant on the graph of this parabola. Write the area of the triangle as a function of the length of the base. Okay, so this length of the base thing uh, has been going on a couple times here, so let's see if we can figure this guy out. So the interesting thing about this problem is that we have um, this triangle, and the vertex is on that parabola. But, and this isn't quite perfect, what B should be, B should be more there. This is our side, right? These two lights are the same length. And then our base is around the x-axis here. So it's always going to be one corner here. So it's possible, it's possible that our triangle could have the vertex here. And then it would look more like this, right? Okay. So as long as these two are the same, that top can be anywhere along the parabola. So it's possible that the entire triangle lies within the parabola, like on the inside here in the first quadrant, or it could stretch out really far over this way. Right? So lots of different options for how that triangle is going to look, and they want an equation for the area of the triangle. So a few things that are important to do in this problem. One is that the height, the height of the triangle is going to be dependent upon where it is on this parabola. So the height is going to be the y coordinate. Right, so if I know the x coordinate here, which is b over 2, that's why I made this picture for you, because it's kind of a tough problem. So if it's b over 2, this is going to be f of b over 2 right up here. Okay, or the y coordinate when you plug b over 2 into the equation. So as you see here, we have b over 2, we're wondering what the y coordinate is. That's going to be 6 minus b over 2 quantity squared. So, and then we should the area of the triangle function of the length of the base. So actually we have this, after we have this, it's actually not too hard at all. Remember, the area of a triangle is one-half base times height. One-half base times height. And we just found an equation for the height, right? It's the y coordinate when you plug b over 2 in. So it's just going to be one-half base times the height, which is the y coordinate here, which is 6. Here with the b and the 6, sorry. Tough to distinguish between that. So 6 minus b over 2 squared. And you really could just leave it like that. But if you wanted to simplify that a little bit, let's see here. So this would be one-half b times 6 minus, this would be b squared over 4. And then if we distribute here, 1 half times 6, that's 3b. Right, so I'm taking this thing and I'm distributing it to both of these. So 3b, and then it would be uh, minus, let's see what this is, it would be um, 1 half times 1 fourth is 1 over 8, so it would be b cubed over 8. So you can do it like that too. Right, these are the same answer. Right, I'll write that so you can tell when I post this on Schoology. Okay, so those are the same answer, really, but it's just uh, one of them we distributed in, and one of them we left it on the outside. Either way, it's okay. All right. So we have a piece of application here. We plan to sell We Love Math t-shirts as a fundraiser, of course, because who doesn't? Uh, the wholesale t-shirt company charges you $10 a shirt for the first 75. After the first 75 shirts, you purchase up to 150 shirts, and the will lower its price by $7.50 per shirt. After you purchase 150 shirts, the price will decrease $5 per shirt. Write a piecewise function that models the situation. All right, well, the first one isn't too bad. $10 a shirt for the first 75, 75 shirts. Let's say that X is the number of shirts. Number of shirts. Okay, so uh, it's just uh, 10X if X is less than or equal to 75. Right, so we have less than, less than or equal to 75 shirts, 10 bucks a shirt. So 750 bucks by the time we get to um, 75 shirts. After the first 75 shirts, if you purchase up to 150, so we know it's going to be 75 less than x, less than or equal to 150. And you could really do uh, 76 less than or equal. That's probably a simpler way to think about it, right? Because you can't have like 75 and a half shirts anyway. So if you get between 76 and 150 shirts, uh, the company will lower its price to 750 per shirt. So that's 7.5x. After you purchase 150 shirts, the price will decrease to $5 per shirt. So it's 5x if x is greater than And that's it. That's all there is to making that piecewise function. So as you see in the real world, piecewise functions really aren't that tough. Um, they're just a lot harder in math class because you end up with things that are not as simple as these functions. So hopefully this was helpful. Uh, you learned something from one of these problems. Uh, I'll post this exact um, solutions on Schoology as well so that you can see it using my work. Nice. Love you guys. It's fun here. Have a great day.